Good morning and welcome to our webinar series um, on tax issues in Ghana. Um, the question is many, many companies have suffered penalties and other sanctions as a result of findings from tax audit by GRE. Must all GRE audits end up uh, in payment of penalties, interest, and surcharges by taxpayer? Well, we are here to have a discussion on this topic, um, navigating VAT uh, tax audit. And the objective of this uh, webinar is to help taxpayers to understand what to expect and how to prepare for tax audit by GRE. Um, and today, our focus is mainly on VAT. So we'll be delving uh, into VAT, what is it about, and then um, cover tax audit in general. So with me today uh, to have this discussion, uh, uh, a lady and a gentleman from our tax unit, um, uh, Esla Odame, uh, a senior associate, and uh, we have Emmanuel Kovna Ado, also a senior tax associate at SCG Chartered Accountants to have uh, this discussion. So uh, just before I ask them to introduce themselves, I would like us to uh, note that um, all participants' mic are muted to prevent feedbacks. And in the course of the session, if you have any questions, contribution, or comments, kindly put them in your Q&A uh, box below, and then uh, we would address all uh, questions after the session. So without um, wasting much time, let me ask Esla, ladies first. So Esla, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, Amos, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Esla Odami, a senior tax associate with over four years experience in the tax unit of SEG. I'm, I've been involved in a variety of tax assignments covering tax audits, tax due diligence work, general tax advisory, corporate income tax, and other tax compliance work, yeah. Right. Thank you, Asla. Uh, so now we'll ask uh, Emmanuel to also introduce himself, then uh, we'll get into action. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Emmanuel Kwabna Ado. I'm also a senior tax associate at SCG with over five years tax practice. Uh, with four years being with PwC, tax line of service, um, I've been involved in a number of tax engagements, which includes tax audits, tax advisory assignments, transfer pricing, corporate tax, and indirect tax assignments. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the introduction. So let's quickly move into action. Um, you know, a lot of times we hear about tax audits and how companies uh, end up paying penalties after this audit. Uh, Esla, let me start with you. When we say tax audit, what is it about and why does uh, GRA even call for tax audits? Okay, thank you very much. Um, tax audits is um, basically an evaluation of an entity's tax returns and its underlying records by the GRA. So the primary purpose of a tax audit is actually to give a reasonable assurance that the tax returns are accurate and complete and also whether the correct amount of taxes have been paid. So there are types of audits, okay, that's the GRA conducts. It could be a comprehensive tax audit, a special tax audit, or a DEX audit. For the comprehensive tax audit, so that's for all type of tax types. We talk about the CIT, the corporate income tax, the PAYE, the withholding tax, VAT, which is even our main focus today, and then transfer pricing as well. And this is normally conducted on field. So that's with the comprehensive audits. They can also conduct a special audit. So this special audit actually focuses on just one type of tax. It could be either VAT only or transfer pricing only, or withholding tax only. And this is also conducted on field. That's at the client side. And then we also have the DEX audits. So this DEX audit could be for all type of taxes or just one type of tax. And it's also conducted at 
the GRE office. So even in this COVID era, now what is happening now is most of the, G, um, the GRE offices are conducting all these type of taxes at their office. So what, when they come for an introduction meeting, they just request for the soft documents and then go back to their office to conduct the audits if you don't have space for the audit to be conducted. So basically these are the type of taxes that the GRE normally conducts, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Esla. Um, so now let's move to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, then we'd also want to find out what is uh, VAT and then um, uh, want to also know who qualifies to, 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 to register or who is required to register for VAT. Can you walk us through those basics? Okay, thank you. Before we move into the VAT tax audit, at least we should learn some basics um, of VAT. What we mean by VAT? Sure. Um, who is required to register for VAT? What are taxable supplies? During our discussion, we'll be using certain terminologies that are it's appropriate that at this time to get some definition to that. Sure. We'll look at how the VAT system works and who is required to file the VAT returns. Okay. So VAT basically is applied on the value of goods and services and imports that we, we, we pay. It forms part of the final price that consumers pay. So VAT in short is normally termed as a consumption tax. Okay. And with respect to who is required to register for the VAT per the VAT Act, Act 870, there are three main types of registration that's recognized under the VAT Act. One has to do with registration based on the person's tax supplies or turnover. And per the Act, if you are making a turnover or revenue of 200,000, you are required to register. Or if you have reasonable grounds to believe that looking at your projection, looking at your budget, you can make the 200,000, you don't have to wait until you make this turnover before you apply for registration. Once you have that projection, you should apply for registration. That's the first one. Or in a month or in a quarter, if you make a sales turnover of 50,000, you should also apply for registration. Okay. The second has to do with the voluntary registration. So someone may just want to register an account for the VAT. Uh, he may not be making the taxable supply, uh, the threshold, but we feel that, well, I have to register. We have that option, which is the voluntary registration. But before you do that, um, you have to convince the commissioner. The commissioner has to be satisfied that you meet certain conditions. I.e., you have a fixed place where you are doing your business, uh, you keep proper accounting records, and other information that the commissioner may deem necessary to make that determination before they register you under the voluntary registration. The third one has to do with what I call the by force registration or the compulsory registration. The GRA has the power to register a person by force. Maybe the person had already met the conditions. It's making a taxable sales or supplies in excess of 200,000 and it has not applied for the registration. The GRA can go ahead and register you. Having said that, these are the three main registration modes. However, there are certain people who don't need to meet this criteria. Someone who is an auctioneer, for example, or a promoter of a public entertainment who is required by the act to register and account for the VAT. Also, all national and regional bodies that we have in the country are required to register and account for the VAT. Once they are engaged in any taxable activity, they are required to register. So basically, these are the forms of registration that is required by the act. Okay, Emmanuel, um, so I, I think from what you are saying, it looks like, um, it's quite clear that if you are making, um, uh, if you have a turnover uh, in excess of 200,000 and your 
uh, activity falls within the defined uh, so, uh, taxable supply, if I can put it that way, then uh, you, you are required by law to register for the VAT. Is that's, that correct? That's correct. Okay, so let me move on to Esla then. Um, I heard Ima use a lot of, uh, you know, terminologies, taxable supplies, taxable supply. So Esla, what, when we say a taxable supply, what do we mean? What, what is it? Okay, so a taxable supply is a supply of goods or services made by a taxable person. If I say a taxable person, is a, a, a duly registered company with a GRE. So it's a taxable, it's a supply of goods and services made by a taxable person for consideration other than exempt supply, which I also come to that to explain what I mean by exempt supply. So the VACT Act specifies um, four main types of supplies to determine whether you are taxable and then if so, in at what rate. These supplies include, we have the standard rated supply, the VAT relief, the zero rated, and we also have another class classification, which is the exempt supplies. The standard rated supply is a supply of goods and services in Ghana or imports into the country, which is subject to the VAT rate of 12.5% and then that of the levies of 5%. So that's the standard rated supplies on goods and services. And then we also talk about the VAT relief. So these are goods and services that are taxable, okay? But then the VAT law relieves specific persons from payment of tax on some specific goods or service which is being purchased in Ghana and some taxable imported goods as well. Um, an example of such supplies could be emergency relief items which have been approved by the Parliament of Ghana and then also a supply of the official use of any commonwealth or foreign embassy. So those are some of the examples of the supplies that the minister grants release. We also have the zero rated supply. So this supply is a taxable supply which is taxed at zero percent and that is where sometimes the confusion comes in. Some people think that because the rate is zero percent so that means it's not taxable at all. So they end up mixing up even the zero rated with the exempt supply. Interesting. <laughs> yes. So with this zero rated supply, it's taxed at the rate of 0%. And an example is export of goods and services. So export of goods and services is rated at zero. It's, it will be interesting to know how zero percent is calculated so <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. well that is for another day we'll, we'll drill in further and um, one of the reasons for actually classifying exported goods okay as zero rated is actually to encourage exports so that's also an, one example and then we move on to the exempt supply so this is where we are saying that this supply is not taxable so it's when a customer of goods or service is not liable to pay VAT by the law. And the, and the first schedule of the VAT Act 870 actually provides a list of goods and services which are classified as exempt supply. There are about 23 items in there. And an example is supply of medical services and then agri products. So yeah, basically that's the four types, the types of supplies. And then when we say taxable supplies, we mean the standard rated supply, the VAT relief, and then the zero rated supply. Yeah. Very well. So, um, Esla, I'll, I'll, I'll still be with you uh, on the um, on the VAT. You know, I, I'm 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 pretty sure that um, VAT is very common in Ghana. Everybody uh, or almost everybody knows about VAT, but a lot of people do not also understand how uh, the system or the VAT system works. So, can you? help us to understand generally how the VAT system works. Okay, so there, there are basically two VAT schemes, two VAT schemes, okay, and that is the standard rated scheme and then the flat rate scheme. And the VAT system actually allows businesses to deduct the VAT paid on purchases. So when you make any payments on your purchases, technically is known as input tax. Okay, so those are the VAT paid on purchases, input tax from the VAT charged on sales, output tax. So the VAT system allows businesses to deduct the VAT paid on purchases 
from the VAT charge on sales. And this, and it's only the difference between the inputs and then the outputs that is being paid to the GRE, the Ghana Revenue Authority. Okay, and this normally, this applies to taxpayers operating under the standard rated scheme. So this only applies to standard rated supplies. Those under the standard rated scheme, they are allowed to offset or claim their inputs, their VAT paid on purchases on, from their VAT paid on sales, VAT charged on sales. So inputs are being allowed against their output tax. So basically the output uh, is the VAT that we charge or um, uh, let me say businesses charge their customers. Exactly. Okay. And then at the end of the day, they are supposed to remit it to GRE. Exactly. And then the import uh, VAT is what um, suppliers charge us exactly. when we buy goods yes. or services from them. Yes. And at the end of the day or the end, at the end of the month, we net of the two and the difference is paid to GRE. Is, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Okay. And I also mentioned of the flat rate scheme. Okay, so taxpayers operating under the tax and the flat rate scheme. These are wholesalers, retailers, and then importers. Okay, so these taxpayers are not allowed to claim inputs against their outputs. So for them, they do not operate under the input output mechanism. So hence they are not able to claim their inputs VAT. For them, they are supposed to account for 3% of their gross revenue and then remit it to the GRE at the end of every month. So that's it with the flat rate scheme. So at the end of every month, standard rated taxpayers or scheme, with them, they have to remit both the, the VAT, the standard rate, the VAT returns, as well as the, the as well as the levies. Okay. Okay, because I made mention that for those under the standard rated scheme, they are supposed to file their monthly returns, both the VAT and then the levies as well. That's okay. the 12.5 and then the 5% levies. Okay, yeah. But for the flat rate scheme, they only file the 3% VAT, which is accounted for at the end of every month. And then also, I would want to state emphatically that not all inputs are deductible, even under the standard rated scheme. So they cannot, there are, are inputs that cannot be deductible against their outputs, against their VAT, which is being charged on sales. Okay. So that moves me to my next slide on the deductible inputs. So someone will ask, when is input tax non-deductible? When are we not supposed to claim our expenses that we've paid on our purchases? When are we not supposed to claim it against our outputs? Yeah. So input tax cannot be deducted on the following. The first one I would want to talk about is entertainment. So entertainment, so unless you are in the business of entertainment, you cannot claim expenses on that. And an example is, let's say, when you incur expenses on hotel bills. Okay, so in carrying on your activity in your business, maybe you incur some expenses on hotel bills. The law is saying that you cannot claim inputs on that expense unless you are in that business, unless you are in the hospitality business. So that's a vivid example. Okay. So unless you are in that business, you cannot claim inputs on entertainment, on this expense okay. against your output. Right. Another item is motor vehicle or spare parts. So with that as well, such expense, unless you are dealing in or you are hiring vehicles or you are selling vehicle parts, you cannot claim expense on these against your, your, your VAT, which is being charged on sales, against your output. And then also payment of fees or subscription. So this is with respect to a membership of clubs, association, social, society of a sporting or social recreational activity. So in this, with this expense to, and if you pay any subscriptions, any subscription fees, you cannot claim inputs against your outputs. And then we also have expenses for making exempt supplies. So for exempt supplies already, they are not vulnerable. So if you are dealing in exempt supplies and you incur any expenses on those supplies, specifically to the exempt, you cannot claim them as inputs. 
And then we also have um, input VAT on goods acquired by a newly registered person. So here the law is saying that a newly registered person for VAT purposes cannot claim input tax on the goods where the goods have been acquired more than four months before the effective date of registration. So I'll give an example here. For instance, if you registered your business, just let me say January 2020, at the beginning of this year, okay, and then you purchased goods somewhere in um, June 2019, maybe in your incorporation process, you acquired some goods and all that before you're able to set up the business and all that. So the law is saying that because in this case, you realize that you purchased the goods six months back. Okay. So in that case, you cannot claim inputs on those purchases. Okay, that's if it's if it's uh, if over it six months. Yes, because it's over because the law is saying that if it's more than four months, that's okay. for general goods. Goods, okay. Okay, if it's more than four months, you cannot. And then we also have in the case of capital goods assets. So in that in that case, that one more than six months before the effective date of registration, you cannot claim inputs. And then lastly, we also have um, expenses incurred in making both exempt and then taxable supplies. So here we have mixed supplies. You have both the, the exempt supplies and then the taxable supplies. And here to the law is saying that before you can claim an input on the taxable supply, you need to obtain a ratio, okay, in order to know which amount you can claim as, um, as input tax. And with that, with the formula, I'll just give a brief on the formula. So. The law is saying that in order to obtain this ratio, okay, you need to first obtain that your total amount of inputs. You need to obtain your total amount of inputs and then after also determine your total taxable supplies. So you divide your taxable supplies by all, all the supplies, all the total supplies, which includes both exempt and then, and then the taxable. And then after you apply it by the input tax that has been incurred for the period. So it's A times B over C. So we'll drill in further to give you more information on how this is calculated. But it's actually very simple. When in, 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 in instances where you have two different supplies. So yeah, Amos. So basically, that's, those are those um, input taxes that are non-deductible. And then how the VAT system Work. So I've just given a general overview of that. Uh, I think that this uh, very interesting one uh, is, 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 is quite detailed, not yeah. general, but it's quite detailed and uh, that's very good. So, but I'll come back to Emmanuel um, uh, on the, uh, I mean, the I mean, failure to register for VAT, what will be the implications? But before I go there, uh, come to Emmanuel, uh, Esla, I've been on you for quite some time, but let, let's finish this up. And can you uh, give us an overview of the general audit process? You know, when, when G, uh, GRA notify you for an audit, what, what was the process that uh, uh, you, one needs to go through? Okay, so with the process, firstly, companies um, receive a letter from GRA. So during, so after agreeing on a date, you then need to inform the GRA team. Mostly you have the names of those who are going to be on the team, the, the audit team. So you need to contact them and then uh, um, inform them about the dates for the start of the, of the audits. So after agreeing, the next thing is an introductory meeting. So during the introductory meeting, there is an introduction. The auditors introduce themselves, management, and also they give the purpose for the audits and also a brief description of the business operation and how long the audit exercise will last. And then also agree on a commencement date. That is when they're actually going to start the audit. In addition to the letter, there's also a list of required documents that the company is supposed to submit to the auditors for the, for the, for the audit exercise to commence. And these required documents could be, so you have the audited financial statements, they, they ask for the audited financial statements, the trial balance, um, sales and purchases invoices, all filed 
tax returns and any other additional documents that may be required during the audit. So these documents are given both in hard and soft copy. And even now in this COVID era, we encourage that we provide these documents in soft copies so that if you don't have enough space for the audits to be conducted, that's the GRA, on site. Yes, on site. Mm -hmm. The GRA can take these soft copies, go to their office, and then go through and then bring out their draft reports. So even before they bring out the draft reports, there are several correspondence that go on. And we always encourage that you communicate with this team, with this tax um, GRA auditors through email, because the phone conversations are not enough evidence in term when there's any future issues and all that. So it's always best for you to liaise with them through emails. So that you have a trail of, exactly, uh, uh, of what, has gone, what on. has gone on. Yeah, exactly. So during, after the correspondence, they issue, the GRA issues their first draft report. Okay. And upon receipt of this draft report, it's now the responsibility of you, the client, you, the company, or the accountant or the tax advisor to review this draft report you need to check the accuracy first the accuracy of these figures that is being picked up by the GRA reports the GRA auditors to avoid any duplication or any other errors and then also you also check the issues that have come up that they brought up maybe they misunderstood the operations of the business so you need to address all these issues in the draft reports and agree on meetings even before the last meeting which is the exit meeting. You also need to ins insist on the exit meeting with the GRE to discuss the draft reports. Because if you don't insist on this exit meeting and they issue the final report, it, 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 you move to a different stage. So after agreeing, after having the exit meeting with the GRE, then after the final, that's after you've agreed on all the issues, a final tax audit report will be issued by the GRE now. So after the final report is being issued, if you still have any issues in there unresolved, then it moves you to the challenging stage, as I would say, that's raising an objection to the final report. And we always discourage that stage because in raising an objection, you need to pay 30% at the point of filing this objection letter with the GRA. So generally, these are the processes that the GRA go through in carrying out an audit yeah very well uh so that's like you know so so in in essence it's best to engage the the, the uh, gra um auditors or the officials at the early stage before they even come out with the draft and at the, if you have any objection uh it's best to address those object uh, those issues at the draft stage exactly before they they, they, they issue the final, final report, uh, report. Yeah. otherwise you would be required to pay a 30 percent uh deposit right exactly. okay uh, before your case is even heard by the commissioner general is that correct yeah that's it oh, okay okay so i would allow you to take a breather and then i'll move on to um uh emmanuel uh, i mean i think he's been uh, <laughs> It's been on holiday for a while, so I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll get to Emmanuel now. So Emmanuel, um, Esla has said a lot, and um, so I want to understand or want to understand what happens when a qualified person fails to register for VAT, and what are some of the again you also want to walk us through some of the key issues that are raised by uh, the GRE during their audits. Uh, so first, we touch on what happens when, when a qualified person fails to register for VAT. All right. Thank you. Uh, according to Section 15 of the VAT Act, uh, it prescribes a penalty for failure to register for VAT. Well, it says that you'll be liable to a penalty of not more than two times the amount of the taxable, the tax payable, from the time that you, have, you were required to register up to the point where you registered. That's, that would be a lot of... Okay, so when the GRA audit comes, um, they'll look at when you applied for registration. Was it at the point when you realized that you were supposed to register? As I've already mentioned, 
the criteria under registration. Yeah. So, well, you met the threshold of 200,000 and from there you applied for registration or you were relaxed and you didn't apply for registration until a certain time before you applied for the registration. Mm -hmm. So the period between when you became registrable to the time that you registered, will, they will compute a penalty of two times the tax that you should have paid. Paid. Yes. So that's so, the penalty for failure to register. So, so in, in effect, it will be in your own interest to, uh, if you realize or if you are aware that your activity is a taxable uh, activity or supply, it will be in your own interest to register from day one. Right. Yes. If you think you meet the threshold. Threshold. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yes. So if you apply, that's the 200,000 or in a particular month and uh, quarter, mm -hmm. you made 50,000. Okay. Okay. Then you become registrable and you are required to, to register and okay. account for the tax. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll move ahead with um, the key issues that normally come out when there's a VAT audit. Okay. One issue that normally comes up has to do with um, the GRA normally does a simple reconciliation. Okay. They do a reconciliation between your revenues that you have declared in your financial statements to the VAT returns for the period. What they do is that they will see if the revenue that you have disclosed reconciles with the VAT that you have, you have filed with them. And normally, and in most times, this reconciliation throws up a difference. Normally, what happens is that the VAT returns doesn't reconcile with the financial statements. If it happens that, then the GRA would surcharge the VAT on, on, on the difference and ask you to pay because they will say that, well, in your financial statement, we are seeing, example, 100,000. Your VAT returns are saying 80,000. That means that you didn't apply tax on a revenue of 20,000, okay? And you'll be liable to pay. What we encourage um, companies or taxpayers to do is that month on month, they should do a reconciliation between their VAT account and then the financial statement, okay? That will help them know whether the revenues that they are disclosing or their returns is tying up to their financial statements. That's one key issue. Another issue has to do with cancelled VAT invoices without replacing the originals in the booklet. Well, there are instances where there is a need after a taxpayer has issued an invoice out, maybe there's a mistake with the invoice in terms of amounts or whatever, and there will be a need to cancel the invoice. It's a good practice for you to um, get the original invoice that you issued to your customer and replace it back into the booklet so that in terms of a tax audit, the GRA will know that, well, this invoice never left your premises. Go, you issued it by Dingo. You have stapled it back in your back booklet. If you don't do that, your revenues that you have disclosed will not tie up to the financial statements. Okay, and then the GRA will insist that you pay tax on that unless you're able to show or if you have issued a credit note, that will also help you to prove that, well, I issued this invoice, but it was canceled and I issued this credit note to correct it. Or I have the original back and it's in my booklet. So that's why I didn't account for the tax on those invoices. Okay. So in, 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 in this situation, as the, uh, as the lawyers will say, the, the name of the game is evidence. Sure. Is that correct? So sure. you need to have evidence sure. that yeah. indeed those uh, invoices that you raised were really canceled. So therefore, you are not liable to tax. So, yes. okay. Uh, another issue that comes up are the supporting documents. As Esla had already explained, for supplies such as zero-rated and relief supplies, we disclose them on the VAT return. When you look at the VAT return, there is a space for zero-rated, there is a space for relief and an exempt. Okay? So once you show those amounts on the VAT returns, what you need now is the document, the supporting document that you have to obtain from the customer, such as the Form 9s is in the case of a zero-rated supply and then a VRPO or the VAT relief purchase order in case there's a relief supply. Because those supplies, you don't account for the VAT, you don't pay 
for the VAT. But what you need is the supporting document yeah. to show that, well, this was a zero rated supply or a exempt supply and, and sorry, a relief supply. And this is the document to show. Okay, if you don't have those documents, you don't, if you don't get those documents to show that these are zero rated, well, you are saying that they are zero rated and relief supply. What is the evidence? Yeah, okay, uh, the DRA would otherwise show it as a standard rated supply and then ask you to pay. Um, another issue that comes up is on the input side. As already, as Esla has already um, said, there are certain inputs that are not deductible. Okay, so the GRA will look at your, your input side and see whether there are certain inputs that you are deducting, such as your input VAT that you paid on hotel bills or entertainment, or if there were spare parts that you bought and you've claimed those inputs, or if there are subscri subscription payments that you've paid and you're claiming those inputs. So if they see all those inputs being deducted from your output, they will reverse it okay. and ask you to come and pay, pay. the tax okay. because they are non-deductible inputs. Okay. And then the final one that I'll mention is late filing or non-filing of returns. So they'll cross-check when you were required to file your returns and when you filed it. If there are any late filing, there are penalties for that, which is 500 CDs plus 10 CDs for each day of default okay. or until the return was filed. Okay, there's that um, penalty there. So basically, these are the key issues that normally comes up in a VAT tax audit. Oh, okay, okay. So thank you, Emmanuel, for that one. So for me, I think the most, uh, you know, the last, I like the last part, which you said uh, late filing or non filing both attract a penalty. Yes. So at all times, you must file at all times and on time sure. is that correct sure. Sure. <laughs> okay so uh, i mean i think it's very important so late filing and non-filing actually attracts a penalty so uh i'll i'll now come back to esla i'll come back to esla um you know having having you know highlighted what the tax audit is all about the vat and the failure to um uh, the penalties or the yeah, the penalties for failure to register for a qualified person. Um, Esla, to avoid some of these things or all of these issues coming up during audits, um, are there any good practices uh, that you may recommend uh, to, to, to taxpayers to, 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 to help them improve their uh, uh, compliance? Yeah, so I'll start with the last point, Ima, you must talked about about the late filing and then the non-filing so you need to file your returns all the time and on time and then also sales sales made in respect of standard rated or zero rated relief all these classifications you need to disclose them separately on the VAT returns so the VAT returns has separate sections where you need to you need to disclose so you need to provide all these types of supply that's if applicable on your returns and you need to have supporting documents that is very key for zero rated supply you need to have all the form nines and then if we leave the VAT relief purchase orders they are very important that you need to have these supporting documents to back whatever amounts that you've declared on your VAT returns and then also also want us to state that the tax credit notes so it's very important for you to issue a tax credit note anytime you've cancelled an invoice. And it's not just any credit notes. You need to, the, the Act, the VAT Act specifies how your tax credit note should be, should be. So all the prescribed information that needs to be on the credit notes needs to be stated in there before the GRA can accept your credit notes as a note issued for a cancelled invoice. Because if you are not able to retrieve the original copy then you need to also bring out the tax credit notes which is being issued for the cancelled invoice and then also original invoices which have been cancelled yes yeah, so i've even stated that already the original invoices which have been cancelled needs to be retrieved and placed back in the VAT booklet so in, in instances where anytime you cancel an invoice you need to 
retrieve that and then also issue a credit note for the cancelled invoice. And then as I stated earlier, you also need to keep proper records and also file your returns on time. So these are the good practices that every company needs to comply by, make sure that they are not exposed to any unnecessary penalties and interest for, for taxes. Yeah. Thank you, um, Esla and Emmanuel for the in-depth uh, explanation to some of the, to, to the point that uh, you have raised so far. So, um, as I indicated earlier, uh, participants can, you know, keep their questions coming in. We'll very soon be attending to those questions. And then, uh, we'll, yeah, I have some questions coming in right now. So, I'll take uh, some few minutes to go through those questions and then um, we, 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 we will be wrapping up very soon. Okay, so, okay, okay. So this is, 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 a, is a question time um, and uh, we, we, we would want to uh, check what questions we have here, so a minute. Um, okay. Okay. Somebody wants to find out Samuel Quasin. Samuel Quasin wants to find out, uh, it said, please, when will input VAT be disallowed? When will input VAT be disallowed? Uh, that's from Samuel Quasin. Um, uh, Emmanuel, you want to take that? Okay. The input VAT will be disallowed um, when it relates to any of these um, expenses, such as expenses on entertainment, motor vehicles, fee subscriptions, as we've already mentioned. But also, an input VAT may also be disallowed when the input is more than six months. Okay. Okay. So you have received an invoice. Okay. You've made some payments. You've paid input VAT. Yeah. And you have not claimed it in your return for more than six months. Okay. Okay. That input VAT will be disallowed. Okay. Very well. Uh, Esla, I want to add up something. Yeah. So, and then also, you need to deal with registered suppliers. Mm -hmm. If you don't deal with registered suppliers and they charge you VAT and you pay, at the point where you are filing your returns or when GRE comes around to conduct an audit, Sometimes they go through these records to find out whether these suppliers have been registered for tax purposes. And one thing that you could use to find out whether these suppliers are registered is their TIN. So you need to check their TIN on their, on their, on their invoices. Always when you are dealing with suppliers, you have to check that they have their TINs on the invoices. So that's what I wanted to to add. So if you don't check that, those inputs as well can be disallowed. Okay, so you must deal with a registered uh, VAT supplier to be able to uh, take the input. So um, this uh, is an anonymous attendee. So he said, does GRA have a VAT booklet for issuing a credit notes? Does GRA has a VAT booklet for issuing a, a credit notes? No. Okay. No. So it has to be in the prescribed format. format. So the VAT Act gives the information that needs to be to be displayed, to be stated on the tax credit note. So first off, you need to that your note, your credit note has to have the name tax credit note boldly written on the on, on the form oh. on that um, note that you're using. So if you have a system generated credit note, you have to make sure that the tax credit note name is boldly written. Mm -hmm. and then also you need to have the name of the supplier, all the details. There are lots of information in there. The amounts, the supplier that you, you deal with, even the customers, everything. You have to show all that. Just like what is on the invoice, the original invoice, you need to provide all this information. On the in credit it. note? Yes. On the okay. Credit note. So, yes. so it could be your own prescribed credit notes, but it should uh, 
follow the format. Exactly. Okay, okay, exactly. all right. Okay, I, th I think that is well explained. Um, so somebody also wants to find out that for SMEs who do not prepare monthly financial statements, what will be the basis for conducting the monthly reconciliation? Um, uh, do you understand the question? Is he wants to just ask for those companies, small companies who do not prepare financial statement on monthly basis? How do you? How would they reconcile their monthly VAT uh, inputs or records? Okay, uh, for for those for those persons, if um, they are meeting the threshold, that means that that person is meeting making a, a turnover of more than two hundred thousand. Though it's an SME, yes, has registered, vision has registered for the tax. Okay, um, now the TRA use the financial statement because it has been audited. Okay. Okay, and it's a reliable source of documents. Okay, um, there are other things that the GRA also uses, not only the financial statements. It also can ask you for your bank statements. Okay. Okay, of the company, and we'll be able to trace the sales that are going through your bank statements to the ones that you are declaring on the tax returns. Okay, that's good. So, I mean, it, I think it's in the best interest of every company, whether small or big, to have a proper financial. Uh, records, records and then yes. the financial statements so that some of these things uh, can be dealt with on monthly basis before they come up during uh, tax audits oh, and yes. uh, you, you are punished unduly for it uh, sure. for not keeping proper records. So, um, um, okay, this one from Ash, Akshay Kawali. Akshay Kawali, is, he wants to find out input VAT. I don't get the question. He said, not applicable for vehicles and uh, spare parts, but if that vehicle are used for factory office, still not applicable for inputs? Yes. Unless the person is in the business of selling spare parts. Okay. 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 Yes. So you cannot, uh, because you bought a part a spare parts for your factory yes. run vehicle, you can claim it. No, you can't claim it. You the, can't claim the, the, input, the input. Okay. Okay. I think uh, uh, Akshay's um, question is answered. Um, so somebody also wants to find out, is the 200,000 threshold an annual sales or monthly sales? I think that one was dealt with. Annual. It's yeah, annual. annual turnover. Okay. But we have the quarterly threshold, which is 50,000. Okay. Yes. And you shouldn't wait uh, till you make the annual turnover. If you have reasonable grounds to believe that you make the 200,000, mm -hmm. you should go and register and account for the tax. Okay. Okay, uh, very well. So, Derek Foley wants to find out, is VAT same as sales tax? Um, well. Yeah, I believe so. It's sales tax. Okay. Yeah. Because it's when... when it's, it's on goods. It's on goods. Uh, that is sales. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay, this one, uh, Joseph Barnes, huh? he said, would you forward the soft copy of presentation? Well, Joseph, I think this one, uh, we would publish the, um, this session on our YouTube and uh, other social media so you can have access to them after the session. Um, okay. Eric Addo answer. He said, do we have to charge VAT on the invoice we send them and at what rates? Okay, you mean the invoice that is sent out? Yes. The, no, basically, the, if, you but, use, if you use the prescribed invoice, invoice. which is the VAT invoice, that's okay. the GRA invoice. Okay. And once you are registered, you are a taxable person, that's you've registered for the tax. On every sale, you should charge the tax. And depending on the scheme that you are operating, mm -hmm. okay, for it, so if you are operating under the standard rated scheme, okay, you should issue invoice for every sale that you make whether export, whether relief, sorry, whether zero rated, whether uh, the normal standard rated or the relief, you should issue invoice for that, mm -hmm. which is the GRE invoice. Okay, okay. So I want to add- You want to add something? Yes, okay. that unless, on, if, if you've been given an authorization to issue your own system generated invoice, yes, yes. then you can issue that invoice in addition to the GRA invoice. 
Okay, but then if you've not been given the authorization, then you need to, the, the GRA invoice is, is mandatory. You need to issue the GRA invoice as well. Okay, okay. So, um, so um, Selassie Nyagbenu wants to find out what happens when after an audit, no audit report is issued. <laughs> I think that's an interesting one. Uh, he said, what happens when after an a VAT audit, no audit report is issued? That's a GRA has conducted an audit, uh, but after the audit, they haven't issued any final uh, report or anything to the effect to that effect. What yeah. happens? Yeah, I think you should you should insist on obtaining the final report from the GRA because if you don't get this report, there could be subsequent audits that the GRA we come up to, to, to conduct and they might go as far back to even audit the previous um, periods that have already been audited because there's no evidence to show that this was actually the GRA's position based on these years of assessment. Okay, they can always go back. So it's best you follow up to obtain the final reports from the GRA. It's always important. Yeah. Okay, so you as a taxpayer, you also have the right to insist on yeah. the report so yes. that you, you, you know that your case has been closed or yes. is pending, whatever yes. it, the situation yes. is, you, should, yes. you, you also have the right to know. Because there's even an instance where you have a credit. Okay, they've confirmed an audit, um, a credit, a tax credit during the audit. So if they don't issue this final report to actually show that, okay, you've audited this entity and then they, are due, they have this total amount of tax credit, you can't utilize this credit because there's nothing to show for. For that, so it's very important to insist on the final audit report. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think in in about five minutes we should be wrapping up. Uh, but I have lots of questions here, and uh, um, I we may not be able to go through all the questions, uh, but as much as possible we would, you know, we would answer the ones that we we, we can we can, and then at the appropriate time we we, we would come back. Uh, with either a webinar like this to further discuss some of your questions or you we would, we would do a write-up to address uh, do, 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 those, those ones. And uh, you can always check on our website, uh, www.scg.com.gh. And then we have lots of resources there where you can, you know, read and understand and even ask us questions. At, uh, you can send us emails at info on scg.com.gh and uh, we would always be glad to address your issues as well. So this will not be conclusive. We would have the opportunity to address most of your questions in write-up or in uh, webinar sessions like this, as I have said. But uh, again, let me go to the questions. I have lots of them. Um, uh, okay, must... Okay, must I pay uh, VAT returns each month for invoice that my customers have not yet paid on? Does it make sense to advance money to GRE? Uh, this is an interesting <laughs> subject. Yes. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is an interesting subject. And uh, I, I don't know if you would want to say something about it or we can uh, defer it. But what I know is that the, the, the law requires you to, you know, once you enter any sales transaction, yeah. uh, you are supposed to file the VAT. Yeah, once it, you have accrued the invoice, the, the invoice. Uh, you have to account for the VAT. But in practice, um, some entities may want to wait uh, before they account for the VAT, once they've received payments. That's what some entities do. Okay. But per the law, once you uh, accrue it in your books, you should, you should pay. Okay, I think this will be an interesting subject to yeah. you know uh, discuss uh, in a future uh, time. But then um, Emmanuel Edu, Emmanuel Edu said, "What type of VAT, standard or flat, should should an entity into insulation charge? They buy materials and install for their clients. I don't know. It, basically, it looks like more of a." Yeah. Is looking at the which scheme, which scheme, scheme. Yeah. well, yeah. If uh, the flat rate scheme is for um, persons operating as retail or wholesale or imports, okay. So, if your nature of business is such that you are into imports or wholesale of goods and wholesale of goods and retail, you should register for the flat rate scheme, 
okay, oh. and charge the three percent. But if you are not into those kind of your nature of business is not like that, then you should register under the standard rated. Uh, there are in, there are times that an entity may even register for both, depending depending on the operations. Maybe they are into wholesale uh, activities or retail activities, and they are also into their normal activity, okay, which is the standard um, scheme. Then they will also register under the standard scheme and operate to do under those those two schemes. Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you. So I, I think we we are just about wrapping up, but then I would want us to just have a look at. Um, Ashke Kawale's question once again. It's look. He said, "It, it, it looks like he's the, in the business of transports." Mm -hmm. So um, the question, his question, basically maybe needs a little more explanation, uh, which maybe we may not be able to exhaust uh, now. But um, Ashke, uh, can you send us an email? Okay, uh, you send me an email, a personal email at amos.edu at scg.com.gh and then I would, uh, we would address that question. It looks like it's a bit, um, uh, it, needs, it needs to be explained further. Yes. So we, we, we will do that and then maybe in future we would also uh, write around those ones to help uh, all our participants. So. All right, so lady and gentlemen, um, I think all we are we are we are we are almost done, and um, we appreciate your time with us. And for all you participants, we are also grateful for your time. I, I think uh, you have stayed with us throughout. We have, I mean, a lot of people participating, and we are we are happy about that. We. We will be engaging you more on, on such topics, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in various subjects that affect business from tax, audit, uh, accounting, and payroll. So we would encourage you to uh, keep uh, following and then signing on to some of uh, this webinars that we'll be organizing. And if you have any questions regarding your tax issues as well, you can always get back to us. Uh, send us email on info at scg.com.gh and uh, also visit our website www.scg.com.gh uh, we have a lot of resources there a uh, lot of write-up that answers some of the questions you have already even raised here and uh but we'll also be glad that uh when you uh, we send us an email we would we would always be glad to answer them so thank you very much uh for joining us today and uh, we hope to see you uh at our next webinar and have a great day and have a great uh, business as well. Bye-bye.